Guys, welcome back to Breakthrough Conversations. We've got a special guest for you today. This is Robert Bruce. He's the author of nine books on astral projection, energy work, psychic self-defense, and more. He is a leader in the field for more than 30 years in the spiritual space, running workshops across the world. And uh, he is back with us for a couple hours on everything spirituality, astral projection, energy work, life after death, and um, even extraterrestrials. So stick around, guys. You're going to love this. I mean, Robert Bruce has written many books on astral, astral projection, energy work, one of the which is my favorite, which is Astral Dynamics and the book Energy Work. I believe you've written about five or six books, or is it nine? Eight. Eight, eight or nine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, quite a lot. I think it's eight or nine, yeah. Mm. If you count the, the audio books as well. Yeah. Because um, I, I met you through a very strong coincidence or synchronicity, um, right before I started my spiritual awakening, when I was working in real estate in a display home, that I was in the middle of nowhere in Wellard, and I had no one come through for the whole weekend, except for two people. The first person that came through was a, a Buddhist monk, um, straight off the plane from Thailand, all in his robes, and was chatting to me about astral projection and talking about the mind and meditation and the, the Buddhist way. But he doesn't like astral projection because he just he wants the, the path to inner peace. Then the second person that came through was you and your wife, um, and I remember chatting with you and you telling me you're an author, but you're very hesitant to say what kind of books you were working on. Yeah. We had a big chat. I got your details. And now seven years later, here we are. <laughs> but I've had a huge amount of um, spiritual happenings and different things and actual traveling in that time since speaking with you. So I'm very grateful for that opportunity <laughs> from yeah. the universe and to dive deep into it. And I wanted to ask you, how did you... When did you first astral travel and when did you find out you had these different gifts and how did they start happening? I was uh, three years old. Oh, wow. Okay. So you kind of unlocked that four. very young. Yeah. When I, um, um, it's an interesting story when I first astral projected. Um, <clears throat> and the first time I astral projected, I, um, went to bed as you do when you were a little kid probably about eight o'clock in the and the and i went into bed and started settling down and then my body started to vibrate and i started buzzing pleasantly from head to foot um and floated up out of my body and wow. then i floated in that position i'm still on my back with my feet in front of me and I floated in that position through my room, down the hallway, down the stairs, through the house. And, you know, went into the front room. There's my parents watching television. And this was in England. And um, then I woke up in bed. Oh, wow. And, and then a few minutes later, I settled in again. I buzzed and came out of my body again. And uh, through my childhood, I had thousands of astral projections. Wow. I mean, I would have several a night um, whenever I went in. Now, I told, and I keep in mind, I'd never read anything about it because we didn't, at, this, at that point, we didn't even own a television. I mean, I couldn't read. And so I remember telling my mother about what I was doing and uh, the, and, you know, typically you pat you on the head and give you a cookie yeah. <laughs> and smile, you know, your kids got an imagination. But your, parents, even listen. your parents didn't have a similar gift to you as far as spirituality and things like that? Or were you? My mother did. My mother did. Yeah. My mother was always interested in that. And uh she, uh, later on in life, she, you know, started going to the Christ Spiritualist Church. And uh, eventually, when I was about 19, uh, I got roped in to take her because it was from um, Fremantle. She had to go to the meet to the church she was interested in. Yeah. And, um, and there was a point there where she couldn't get a lift there. So she roped me into taking her in. And originally, I used to, you know, I'm a young guy of like 19 uh, in the Merchant Navy, and uh, I used to take her in and then go to the local pub and wait, have a few beers, and then pick her up. But after doing that 
several times there. You ended up, I ended up meeting some of the people there and I ended up attending myself and it, it kind of changed everything. But back to being a child again, it's a, so it's a very interesting story. Um, the night before I had my first astral projection, I had an experience and there's a reason why I remember these things apart from them being spectacular phenomena. The night before I, I had been having episodes of waking paralysis where you wake up paralyzed in your body. Now I had those my entire life. They didn't ease off until I was about 40. Wow. Oh, okay. So I had them for like 40 years. And in my 30s especially, I would get them two or three times a week. And it got to the point there where I was so wired because this was a horrible experience, you know, being paralyzed and uh, that I could sense it coming on. And I, I learned to roll out of bed instantly because you wait one second, it'll catch you. But mm -hmm. there, were, you had a little, uh, uh, a little feeling coming on just before it hit you. If you acted really quick, you could stop it. Yeah. But um, and now the day before I had my first astral projection, I had a paralysis episode which was plaguing me as a child. And you, of course, your parents don't understand that you can't, you don't need, you have the words to tell them what's happening mm -hmm. at that age, and. Um, I'm paralyzed in bed and there was this light coming from beside me now and I'm moved. Now I couldn't physically move. I know now because I've uh, explored this, I was moving inside my astral body, which was still in my physical body. And I moved around inside my physical body. So I looked to the side of me without physically moving and sitting beside me, was a large ET insectoid being. It was like a uh, giant praying mantis. Wow, what color? Uh, it was like a, I, I couldn't really see the color. It was okay. like, it, yeah. I couldn't tell. It was like a gray, greeny sort of a color, Green. like you'd expect, but I didn't Green. note any Big black eyes. color. Big eyes, yeah. Uh, but imagine the head of a, of a praying mantis. Yeah. It, it was identical. It wasn't like a giant praying mantis, but it was intelligent. Now, in front of it, about the size of a soccer ball, it had a ball of glowing, pulsating light. And it was this pulsating light which was causing my paralysis, I felt. Um, and uh, I've explored this memory a great deal. Um and it actually led me to developing um, a, tech, a new technique for recovering memories, childhood memories. My memories go back to in my mother's womb and before I was even conceived. Oh, wow. Uh, you, you can I have that. some memories of that. How do you, right. what, what technique do you use to unlock such memories? It wouldn't I'll be get to that. I'll get to the technique afterwards. It's a simple technique. Mm. Um, but the, what happened then, I have sort of looked at this uh, praying mantis being that didn't seem to notice me. Um, and I looked at it and after about probably 10 seconds of looking at it, it looked at me and noticed that I was awake, reached out and tweaked this ball of light and I, I'm out for the count. It knocked me out. And now this was the night before I had my first astral projection. I have to say, it, it seems that this... ET altered me. And I think this had been happening um, quite a lot in my childhood because I'd been plagued with the paralysis sensation, which I remember was just terrifying. On your little kid and suddenly you're paralyzed. You know, you can see the room around you, and but you can't move. Uh, you can't even blink, you know. It, the paralysis is ex yeah. extensive. Um, and But years later, um, uh, many years later there, when I was in my uh, probably 30s, 
I developed a technique and I did this intuitively. It's like a download of ideas. I was doing a, a great deal of meditation. I started meditating when I was about 20 and continued on. And uh, around this time, my 30s, I was doing at least four hours a day. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, I did a lot of meditation. And um, the I had the idea, you know, I'm thinking about certain things and that in my mem in memories and that I had. And it just came to me um, to explore a memory. And I had a memory that I was exploring. And uh, this was of a, an ET abduction when my mother and I were physically abducted by ETs once uh, during a road trip. And this was what led me to putting so much focus on a single memory from, from years, years before. I was about 30 then when uh, I took my mother and I, we went to a development circle at an old English medium's house. And it was a 35 minute drive from where we lived. And on the way back, now we the lady we're sitting with was in her 80s. And my mother was elderly too. And so it wasn't that late. We left there usually about 11, 11.30. You know, that's pushing it because old people get tired easily. And um, I didn't note the time we left, but we'd had a substantial meal there. And then we, you know, we'd done our sitting and stuff and uh, group meditation and mediumship stuff. And uh, then we left. Now, so I would say it would have to be about 11.30 midnight. Now, 35-minute drive. Now, on the way home, uh, about halfway home, uh, we go, went through a wooded area, which wasn't built up in those, in those days. And um, I'm driving, um, what was it, like a, a 1985 model Holden Statesman. It's a big General Motors Solo V8. Yeah. I like car. Yeah, yeah. Older, to, older one and a great car, electric windows and that, you know. Yeah. And I'm cruising down the road and I'm doing exactly um, 90 kilometres per hour because, you know, I'd looked at it. And ahead of us, about half a kilometre ahead, there were trees on both sides of the road there. And this brilliant light exploded from about halfway up the trees, about half a k in front of us. And it was so powerful. There were huge, stark fingers of light coming down on the road. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what could cause a, a light that bright in the middle of the night? And I'm thinking an atomic explosion or something like that. <laughs> you know, would. because it was startlingly bright. And as I moved towards it, now, once this, I saw the light, my foot came off the accelerator and I'm coasting a little bit. I put my window down because my window was dirty and I wanted to put my head out to see the light more clearly. My mother sitting beside me was like half onto my lap, also trying to look out of my window to get a better view of this. And all of this happened in a few seconds. The light we're looking at coming through the trees was moving upwards. Now, just as it crested the top of the trees, this brilliant ball of light, um, quite large, uh, as it did, we were probably, I don't know, probably 200 meters from that point. And then a split second later, my hands are back on the wheel, my window's up, I'm doing 90 kilometers an hour. My mother is sitting next to me quietly with her hands in her lap, sort of nodding. Now my mother was never quiet. She was born talking. <laughs> you know, she like she was my best buddy, you know, yeah. about spiritual things. And we were always talking about stuff. And my mother, for her to be quiet was noticeable. That's why. Are you okay? Have you died? <laughs> like, it just and uh, and now I still had the memory of what had happened that probably fifteen seconds approach 
to the light and then it's stopping. I had that very clear in my mind. And I said, Mom, what was that light? And she said, what? What light? I said, that, that light coming through the trees. And that she said, oh, uh, I don't know, dear. I went back to being quiet. Wow. Now, we continued driving and we got home and I was feeling a bit weird. My stomach was rumbling a bit. I thought something's wrong there. I mean, I'd only recently had a substantial meal. And so we got home and went inside there and it was uh, 5.30 a.m. 5.30 a.m. in the morning. We had lost five hours. Wow. Because, you know, we leave at like before midnight, 35-minute trip. It should have been about 12.35, roughly. And um, it was 5.30 because the sun was starting to rise. It wow. was uh, in some of the sun was starting to rise in the, you know, the grey of dawn. And, uh, and that, that gave me the memory. And I was about uh, 31 at the time. But years later, a few years later, that bugged me so much that I was exploring that memory by reliving it and trying to uh, make it bigger to, to mm. you know penetrate behind it because I knew something had removed part of my memory. I've had like four and a half hours of memory removed. Mm. And uh, so I wanted to find out what that memory was and how that was done. And I discovered by exploring that memory, a lot of associations with other memories and that kept popping up. And so I explored further and I went back to some earlier memories as a way of like exercising memory. And uh, I went back to some early childhood memories. And the earliest I could remember at that time was um, probably when I was about four years of age. And that's pretty normal. Most people don't remember early childhood. Yeah. Or much of it and uh, anyway we started working on that one and that started to remind me of other events and I found my memories were going uh, through association were popping up and I was going further and further back until I remembered my birth I remembered then I remembered being inside my mother's womb wow and most people would think it's dark inside a mother's womb, but it's not. You'll find light passes through your flesh quite easily. If you put a flashlight under your hand, for example, you can see light comes through your flesh. Yeah. You can see. And with a woman's, uh, when a woman is pregnant there, light penetrates that into the womb. So the baby that's growing in there is, is in... Uh, it, the light is like a strong apricot sort of colored light. Wow. Um, anyway, the, I had lots of them, and then I even had some memories. Apart, what, one of the ones that came up very clearly were the, the ET memory, and that came up very clearly. That's why I remember it so clearly. Mm. And I did have a, a niggling, remember, a very small memory of that happening earlier. But when I went back to that memory there, I found out a lot more uh, about that memory. And um, uh, the furthest I could go back, it seemed to be just before I was conceived. And I was floating in space above the planet. And I was aware of the stars around the sun, you know, the atmosphere. And I'm floating in like the high atmosphere. And I'm... A, my memory is approaching this like another being. So as another being, I'm approaching my earlier self, the progenitor of me, and I'm trying to communicate with it. And all I'm aware of, because I'm trying to find out where it came from and what happened before this, but all I can get is that behind where I had come from, was the vast emptiness of space, which was kind of scary, made me shiver. Wow. I did not want to go back there. It was like this horrible emptiness behind me. But in front of me, where there was this bright life. I'm about to enter 
which was like fantastically interesting. And I, I loved this and I really, really wanted to do this. Mm. And that's the furthest back I've been able to, do, to go. And of course, then I was conceived and the, the spirit attached to my mother entered my mother, however you um, perceive it to be. Wow. And yeah, so um, that's why people ask me about abortion and that what my stance is on abortion. Now, I have to say that I am very strongly pro-life, yeah. but I'm also pro-choice. <laughs> at the same time yeah because every human being has a right to do with their body what they wish that's true. it's like that's true. Yeah. yeah if you want to kill yourself that's fine yeah and uh and suicide's not a bad thing it's like it you know you get a lot of uh, baggage about suicide in the world today it's a terrible thing like suicide to go to hell no they don't Suicides fare no differently to anybody else in the afterlife. I studied the afterlife my entire life. I haven't written about it. Uh, well, I've written a couple of articles about it, but uh, yeah. the I've put a, lot, a great deal of study into it. And not just study, I'm an exploration of the afterlife mm. with the help of my higher self. It yeah. doesn't get any better than that. Beautiful. I mean, I've followed the afterlives of lots of, animals and human mm. beings as well yeah. just, just it's interesting we on into the afterlife uh, robert because that's going to be a whole other chapter could you tell us the technique that you use to help attain those memories of oh yeah it's very really simple um i i've have to, i have taught people how to do this i have students uh, around the world um now and they've done it successfully and you can get some good results in the first session, but to get a lot of your memories back in your childhood and that, it can take a year or two of regular practice. Mm. And I, I recommend that people make this a part of their regular meditation practice. And so if you have like an hour a day that you, you meditate, you put by 10 minutes for this part of your as a part of your practice yep. where you go back and you keep it keep a journal of where you've been at what memories you're working on and you work on that and then you go back to that memory and you flash it out and you try and immerse yourself into an early memory mm. and you when you immerse yourself in it your your brain starts to remember more and more details about that event so let's say um a good example I used once was uh, a birthday party when I was four years of age and my mother put on this big garden party thing and that it was lovely. And I'm remembering and I'm immersing myself in this and I start remembering other people and little events that happened, what the food was we were eating. And then I remember other things and then that triggered other memories which were kind of associations to this and what was happening there. And that allowed me to go back into to these other memories, which I didn't recall before. Wow. And sometimes you're going backwards. Sometimes you're going sideways. Sometimes you're going forwards. You're triggering uh, memory associations, maybe a couple of years when you were six years old, another birthday party. And then you'll go other times when you were like four as well and then back for then you start going back if you mm. keep at it you find these other memories and you start to map out if you're recording these memories which i do in a kind of a mind map mm. uh where you draw circles and lines and little you know headings of the different types of memories and that um and, but you will progressively go further and further back. And while you are doing this, your mind is learning what your intention is and what you want to do. And it is starting to help. And what I learned from this is that we forget nothing in our existence. Mm. 
no human being does. But what happens is we archive memories just like a computer does. You know, when you have memories in you that get a bit old and you're not using them, at a certain point, they start getting archived and we start forgetting them. They go out of our conscious mind. If something happens to remind of, of an early event, you know, it may pop up and say, oh, I remember that, you know, but a lot of stuff we is difficult to remember. And this is why, uh, I mean, to remember things in the long term, look at the lengths that school teachers go to and that, the, you know, the science involved in teaching children. You know, my wife's a teacher. It's like I know quite a bit about teaching and it's like the process of, of teaching and, and learning um, is uh, something like, for example, you can't just read through your times tables once or twice and hope to remember them. You won't. You can't read through a lengthy poem or something or a song once or twice and hope to remember. You won't. But so to remember that, so it's in conscious memory all the time, is we, you know, through repetition, we do the times tables until we know it by heart. And then we know it will stick and it will stay there. And that actually forms a part of your mind. It programs your mind to work in numbers, you know, decimals, you know, multiplication yeah. tables. It's the foundation of mathematics. It's incredibly yeah. important if you're going to school and want to learn that. So we're programming our mind in a way when we're going back into these memories and really absorbing it and sitting in it and it creates other maps we can go into. Yeah, it That's does through associations. Now the, the associations are there. And the secret is go back to an early memory, explore that and spend time, immerse yourself in it. And you will find that will trigger other memories. So would you and be going... Matter Sorry, so would you be going from the earliest memory that you can remember or are you just picking any memory? Any memory, but it's if, if your intention is to go back to, uh, to remember your earliest memories, then you want to find the earliest memories and then immerse yourself in them and let them flesh out. And you find that the memories will grow larger and, and more detailed the more time you spend in them. And if you do this regularly and you keep a journal of what you're doing to remind you where you're at, um, you'll find you will, over a period of time, work your way back. And these earlier memories start becoming recallable. And, you know, you can remember where you came from. I say I've never been back to before um, that memory I have of floating in space, waiting for, I think, um, I think I'm waiting for conception. Yeah. It was, some, it was something like that. Do, do you believe um, in past lives and things like that? Do you think if you went back, you'd go into another life you lived previously? Well, at the time, I had a, a, a typical New Age type belief system. I do not now. Mm. Absolutely, I'm not a New Age person now. Even though the bulk of my market is, you know, definitely New Age, I understand th th that. I mean, I had um, a New Age belief system um, up until... Um, I was about 37 when a master materialized to me and gave me instruction. Mm. And it gave me what I call the catch basket concept, which is an article on my website there. And this is my Bible, mm. which is, and it basically, because at the time I was struggling intensely to go further. Now keep in mind, I had, Apart from a, a lifetime of experience, I had suffered demonic possession. I'd lived through that, uh, a few weeks of that. Uh, I had raised Kundalini many, many times and pretty heavy phenomena and stuff like that. But I was still hitting a brick wall. And I didn't realize that the master told me the reason why I couldn't go any further when nothing was making any sense was because my, I was blinding myself with my own beliefs. And it told me, basically, it told me I had to proceed through the steps of my own personal experience 
And what that means is I have to use scientific method, which means I have to remain a, to stay an open-minded skeptic and to experiment. Now, when I do something, if, if you give me an idea or, or a belief of your own there, I can uh, be open-minded about that and sceptical in a friendly way. But then I take that away and I will try to do what you've told me you've done and see if I can repeat that. If I can repeat that, then it becomes my personal experience as well. And that's real. This is something you can believe in. It comes true. Everything else, no, you cannot believe in anything else. Mm. This is why our civilization is where it is at the moment because we have used scientific method for hundreds of years. If you understand scientific method, it's the most important um, thing there is. Mm. Now, there's no reason why we should not apply this to spirituality. We absolutely yeah. should. Mm. Because, you know, something is, nothing is real. I mean, um, this means you can't believe anybody and it feels like you're going to be a bit lonely, particularly with church groups and things like that. Now, religious thinking is, is actually, it's in the DSM-4, the Diagnostic Service Manual. It mm. is like religious, it's a psychological condition, a psychological disorder, really. DSM-4. DSM Yeah, was that that's um, religious extremism and things like that is, uh, you know, I won't mention any particular religions and that. Yeah. But if you get religious thinking, which is based upon things which are completely outside of personal experience. Mm. So you are believing in things. This is no different to believing in fairies as a small child or the Easter Bunny or Father Christmas. You know, we raise our children like that. We give them those beliefs and we go along with it, you know, supporting the lie. And then when children get to an age of I know, 10 or 12, they discover that we've been lying to them. Mm. It never goes damn well. <laughs> and uh, But that religion is a very similar thing to that, although it has, you know, spiritual ideals and things like that woven into it. But it's still outside of personal experience. You right. have no evidence. You have been basically brainwashed with, you know, like in this world, Christian propaganda. Mm. You know, you've been given it given to you at a very young age. And the idea is you get roped into going to church and, you know, you're taught not to question the church and just do as you're told. Yeah, basically, you've experienced like, firsthand, even seeing and how your beliefs create a ceiling that you can't break through in your meditations, in your practices, and in your work. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what, that's exactly what happens. Mm. What you're saying there that happens when you it's outside of personal experience mm. because you are living like a fantasy, and this is completely opposed to working with your higher self. The higher self is AKA slash God slash. There are lots of names used for the divine in this world. And the divine, when you get to understand it, it doesn't care what you call it. it you know, the hundreds of religions there are around the world there, they, they make a big deal out of it. No, no, God's called Jehovah. No, it's called Allah. No, it's called this. It's called that. You know, but they're all talking about the same thing. Yeah, it's all about the message. Yeah, yeah. We get stuck in the but they're, no, they're talking about the same being. If you're talking about your different versions of God, they're all looking towards the same light. They're all looking at the sun. You go to every different country in the world there and ask them what they call the sun. Everybody's got a different name for it, but they're all pointing at the sun. Exactly. It's but, like, yeah, very true. Yeah. Well, it's exactly subject, the same thing. While we're on the subject of God, how would you define God from your personal experiences and what it is? To God is like the source. It, there's a quick explanation where you can say everybody is God. Everybody has a part of God in them. 
Now, I say, ev- this is correct. Every living thing has a spark of God within it. Mm. But you have to understand how this works. You need to understand the mind split effect, which I demonstrate in my work on astral projection. The mind split effect is that when you have an astral projection in progress, your physical body and mind can still be awake and conscious and thinking, albeit paralyzed in the bed, because astral projection causes waking paralysis, where you're paralyzed and you can't move, but you can be awake. You can't move a muscle. Now, you're awake and functioning mentally in your physical body. Now, your astral body is out. That is also functioning and independently. Um, They're not aware of each other. Now, once you've done that, other aspects of you start appearing in higher dimensional levels. But for the basic aspect, there's, there's the basic aspect of the mind split effect is your physical body mind. It's one, it's the original. The second one is the astral body, which is a, a copy, first copy. The third one is your dream mind. Now, your dream mind can become active at the same time as you're astral projecting while you are still awake. So that's three aspects of you functioning simultaneously. And if you really push this, you go to the higher dimensional levels and you can be conscious in all of the higher dimensional levels simultaneously. Okay. This gives you an eye that you can be in multiple places at one time. Can I just clarify something quickly? Because I, I experience sleep paralysis quite a lot. Um, mm-hmm. So in those moments, my astral body could be out and doing doing things, but I'm only consciously aware of my physical body and being paralyzed. How do you yes. begin to expand your consciousness into the astral body so you're not experiencing the paralysis, but you're actually traveling the planes? The pro- that, that, is, that, is, that is not the problem. The problem is downloading the memory of your astral projected double into the physical body mind after the event. Okay. You can't. You could. You could. You could be out of body for a minute or an hour. Now I train my students and I bully them to aim to have a ten-second astral projection, because if you understand what's happening, um, if if you don't understand what's happening, you think you can get out. You can only be in one place at a time. Therefore, you have left your physical body. It's asleep, an empty husk on the bed. Mm. This raises thoughts like it did with early astral projector projection authors and that your body is left empty and vulnerable. Maybe a demon could get into it. And if anybody maybe disturbs you, like opens a door and wakes you up, you could physically die. Oh, but wow. All these, there were magical rituals appeared. Over the last hundred years, that when you astral project, you have to bind the physical body in iron chains, real ones, yeah. to protect the body from demonic spirits possessing your what is obviously an empty shell because your astral body is out and you can't be in two places at once. Well, my work proves that you can. Mm. But this also, and I go to great length in astral dynamics to explain this. And uh, you you find this shows you, you expand the mind split effect over the entire world. So instead of it just being a few copies of the one original, um, which, and the one original, by the way, you you could say um, leaves when you physically die with the astral body. Mm. So your astral body is actually your soul, you could say. Mm. Um but understanding this, if you expand it to the rest of the world, it becomes apparent that God, source, whatever you want to call it there, is in everything. And if you work with this, trying to find it, you will find it's in other people, it's in animals, all animals. So, I mean, all animals have to project. Oh, wow. Cats and dogs and horses and Hamsters are some of the animals I've 
observed personally, astral projecting. They astral project. Children astral project all the time. So can and all of us astral, astral project when we're young and then we just forget? Or is this kind of like something that you have to... Yeah. Yeah, okay. It, it's yeah. like when, when children are young, particularly, say, up until the age of about eight or ten, they're really active in the astral. And then a child's life gets really busy. You start you know, working with other people and groups and things and school and family, and there's a huge amount going on. And, um, and yeah, the, you, you, they start to lose. Well, they don't stop astral projecting. Um, children don't, I'm confusing myself here. Children don't usually remember. It's very rare for a child to remember an astral projection. You know, like it's just like an adult there. They don't remember it. Even though they are out of their body and they're quite active, they don't remember it. Um, so if you can't remember it, it never happened. True. Yeah. This continues throughout life. So, I mean, you astral project all the time. You're not remembering it because typically most people, and I have explored this with people, um, and I may explore it by in the astral going around looking at other people who are asleep. And I find most human beings um, have an astral copy of themselves floating a couple of feet above their physical body, mimicking the sleeping position of their physical body. Wow. Now, there are also higher levels. This higher level projections are occurring but these are happening at a very low energy level there's not a lot of activity going on and of course afterwards there's no memory download mm. so you wake up and you don't remember it you may remember little bits and pieces here like mixed in with your dreams but you don't remember it so um and it seems to be the um I think people who tend to be natural astral projectors, you could you could say their spirit, their, their soul is older mm. and it and more experienced. And therefore it is like born with these abilities built into it. And some people like this. I mean, you could spend, I know people who spend years trying to astral project and really trying hard and failing. And I've known 15-year-olds that have picked up my work, flip through until they get to the technique page, and then sit down and do it. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. It's, it, it's easy, you know, and they think, and this is why everybody out there, uh, apart from my work there, um, people who are interested in astral projection, you try and study the techniques of other people who have succeeded, people who write books on this, and you try and copy their techniques because they did it, this worked for them, and you try and make it work for you. You need mm -hmm. to realize, though, it's these people are different. I'm different. Yeah. You know, I was, I think, altered by ETs mm -hmm. because of the... And I've had a lot of ET exposure in my life, including two physical abductions. Once with my once in the company of my mother and once in the company of a stranger. That was in broad daylight. Do you have much memories of the abduction itself or only missing time and missing memories? Originally only missing time. The first event that happened to me, I remembered like 10 seconds of it the light appearing over the trees Tree. up yeah, to yeah. a point. It's like 10, 15 seconds maybe um, that I remember and then blank, nothing wow. after <laughs> that. Now, I know how they do that. They remove a memory slice. I, you know, a few seconds of memory are taken out here and there, and you can encapsulate a memory completely mm -hmm. and remove it from a person's recallable memory. And it's real. I spent many, many years trying to get that memory back until I finally found a way to recover it. Yeah. But how come they still wouldn't they have like thought that that gap in time that they, that they left would have also triggered some sort of like um, some sort of thought process or some sort of like investigation from from a person? Because it's like what? I think 
maybe they do, maybe they don't. I mean, with most people, the memory's not there. They're not going to push it. Mm, I mean, yeah. it's pretty rare to come across someone like me who is going to put that amount of effort into, you know, trying to find out what happened. And it took me several years. And I remember um, up until the time before my mother died, um, she remembered the event, but she never wanted to talk about it. She would always change the subject. Mm -hmm. I'd raise it and say, Mom, do you remember that time when we saw that bright light in the car? And she said, yeah, I remember that. I said, what do you think it was? And she would always change the subject. Now, my mother was intensely interested in ETs and spiritual phenomena and that. In that sense, we were very much alike. But yeah. for some reason, she never wanted to talk about that. She always changed the subject. And I think that was something that was implanted in her not to pursue it. And or maybe also because it maybe would offended her religious beliefs and that. I don't know. So but it was, many beliefs, you reckon? Yeah, it was it's was kind of weird. But when I broke through it, what I did was I uh I was using association and I was creating fantasy memories, uh, which may have fitted what actually happened. And I tried hundreds of different possibilities until I came across, you know, across something which must have been close to what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And that triggered the memory. And the memory was the spaceship, which was like spherical in shape, um, landed on the road. And this was like, say, midnight on a back road, very quiet, no other traffic. Mm -hmm. And it landed very quickly. A door came down very quickly and a ramp came down. Now, I slowed the car down and I carefully drove the car up the ramp into the ship, put on the parking brake, turned the motor off, and I remember turning and looking to my mother as this ramp closed behind us and we took off. My mother was all excited. Wow, a real spaceship in that. And it, it went on from there. And this, all this memory flooded back in of what actually happened. And the ship flew up into the atmosphere somewhere. We were inside of it. And I remember however length long we were in flying for, might have been 15 minutes or so, and there was a doorway near this, like, garage hangar we were in, which fitted our car, and there's a doorway there, and we saw a couple of beings go by, a couple of people, a couple of them were human, and a couple of them were the grey ETs, typical smaller little so greys. No, no praying mantis ones there, just typical grey aliens. Wow. And then we docked with a larger ship, huge, and very high in the atmosphere. Uh, I can't tell you how high it was, but when I looked out of a window from inside the larger ship, the earth looked to be about the size of a basketball held at arm's length. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't know how that was. So we're really high. Yeah. Above high atmosphere, you know, and we're in um, space at this moment, yeah. Sorry, so we're in space at this moment, in space, yeah, space, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the earth was like a, the size of a basketball held at arm's length, wow. And uh, the we there were many, many other ships docking with this. This is a giant ship, and there were like hundreds of other spacecraft identical to the one we were in docking because there was a couple of windows in there we could see it happening and uh we docked very quickly and we got out and there's like this huge uh it was like landing at a, a like an airport there was this um hit very large wide corridor down and there were these like docking ports like every every 20 meters, I suppose. And right. there was like all these doors opening up as far as I could see. And there were people getting out of it. And there were alien type beings there. And these were humans, but they're wearing like a gray uniform with a little skull cap thing on them. And uh, they were taking people and guiding them into uh, a main room. 
So would you say these are all like people who've also been abducted at the same time? Possibly, or these are people who are working with them? Well, people were coming and seem to be coming and going. Uh, so I'd say around about the same time, for, maybe for that night. Then again, night on this part of the planet, maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, when we got, we were led down uh, a very luxurious hallways and that, and we were led into a main room. And the main room was gigantic. It was like the size of Congress in the USA, massive room and heavily carpeted. And it was outfitted with beautiful upholstered, chairs they looked to be made of like leather and there was hundreds of chairs and all the chairs were surrounding um a um dais which had this like huge crystal on it it was a bit like the the movie the dark crystal in that sense mm -hmm. it had this crystal and there were already dozens of people sitting around of it looking at this crystal and the crystal was vibrating and pulsing with light and my mother sat down and looked at it and like was kind of out of it then i wouldn't sit down and uh because you know i, I was aware of where we were and i wanted to explore further and an older man comes up to me with the et uniform on and he knew my name he said robert let's go for a walk and he took me for a walk around the ship and he showed me some uh, giant windows and that, which is where I saw the earth and how far up we were and uh, was talking to him. And this goes on for quite a long time, but the, the essence of it is there. He tells me, he said, the, um, what they were doing, he says, we're abducting people. He says, when we can get them physically, he says, we abduct them um, and bring them up here and expose them to cultural programming. He says, which we've been doing for hundreds of years. He says, we are trying to program people with uh, good ideas, like uh, to get rid of things like racism, sexism, war, all of the bad things we have in our world today. And uh, he says, when we can't get people physically, he says, we abduct them astrally. He says, most of the people we do, most of the time we do this with astral abductions, but we get, you know, a few hundred people every day we abduct physically from around the world. Wow. So anyway, I'm, I'm shortening down what happened there. And uh, then um, eventually I went and sat down with the rest of them. And then it it was over. Then I woke up in, well, I didn't wake up. The uh, the next minute I'm back down on earth again and not remembering this. That's incredible. Did you pull well, so much yeah. out of that? Do you believe that these beings are um, the Galactic Confederation or, or the service of good and of love? And I, don't, I don't know. I have no experience with that. It, it makes sense that there is something going on. There's something... A, this, these people were organised uh, and it looked like they were, you know, quite big as like yeah. a, a very large organisation at work in the world around us. But these were physical ETs, very high, highly advanced, um, beyond where we could ever hope to detect them. I mean, our technology compared to theirs is like the difference between... Uh, what you know australian aboriginal was a couple of hundred years ago and and today it yeah, is a yeah. massive difference huge so obviously they seem like they're intervening in like the development of our civilization but they don't want to do it directly yeah they yeah. seem to have like a non-interference policy and you can understand why because it would be hugely destructive to uh yeah. civilization to know about them yeah i mean there have been studies done on this and i think it's well known and proven that uh, if like an advanced civilization you know exposes itself to a lesser one the advanced civilization always ends up destroying 
the lesser civilization. You can't help it. It just happens. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. But wouldn't they be such highly evolved beings that they would kind of understand or they would try and um, be trying to aid us into becoming a more advanced civilization? Because if they, I'm assuming if they're at the point where they're doing intergalactic travel and they're able to like um, imprint memories and kind of change the way people perceive the reality down here on Earth, they would also have like a higher pre- in which they kind of um, interact with reality. I I understand what you're saying. I I really don't know. I have a limited exposure, like a snapshot of these events. Mm -hmm. And I've got a, I've got a couple of them. I mean, the other time I was abducted, I was driving from Perth to Albany, which during in the daytime, and I was about halfway there. I was actually coming back from Albany to Perth. About halfway back, I picked up a hitchhiker, and um, I, I remember I called into a gas station and bought a six pack of beer. And uh, we were driving on the, down the road. It was a nice warm day, and had a couple of beers each on the way. And um, and then of course you drink a couple of beers there. You got to empty your bladder. And so I pulled off the road. I saw a little sidetrack under the trees in the, the wilderness beside us. So I pulled off and went up under the trees, stopped the car. And I'm driving a, a 1975 Volkswagen Combi camper van nice. and uh, air-cooled motor. And um, the great car, I had a few of them. And uh, I, I pulled off there. The motor was hot. Of course, I've been driving couple of hundred miles and I stopped the car and got out one side and the other guy got out the other side and we both emptied our bladders there Mm. now what happened next was interesting the I remember my memory comes back and I'm standing there uh, with my fly zipped up and I'm sort of gazing at the trees And I'm aware of my car being behind me. And it's like I'd just woken up. And I woke up and I thought, oh, get in the car and get going. And the guy on the other side with the door open was also acting very vague. And he was like just standing there gazing into the forest. And I had to call him a a couple of times before he like came to and got in the car. And then I started the car up then, I remember, the weird thing about that was it's an air-cooled motor. The motor was cold. We stopped to empty our bladders, which only takes like a minute or two, the most, and get back in again. And I had a red-hot engine, which was now cold because the automatic choke kicked in. And so we'd been there for a few hours, according to that. And we drove back onto the highway and started off again and drank the last two beers we had there, but the beer was suddenly warm. So we had a cold motor and warm beer. It's only a couple of things that made me suspicious, but years later, I started working on that memory um, and I still haven't recovered that memory yet. Um, But um, I had... I left in the morning. I left about nine o'clock in the morning. It's a five-hour drive at the most, four and a half, five-hour drive. And I left at nine o'clock in the morning, and it was about 6 p.m. when I got to where I was going. So that is uh, nine hours. Wow. Whole day. So I've got like four hours missing, at least. There'll be some good memories in there. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Can I touch on something? Um, you mentioned yeah. before that you had issues with demon or dark spirit possession. Um, I don't want to chat it. Is there any dangers for people when they're actual projecting and getting involved in spirituality? How to, what to look out for and how to stay safe in these predicaments? That's, that's not a concern when you're astral projecting. Uh, if you come across anything like that while you're astral projecting, it was already pre-existing. Uh, or if you have something attached to you, and you ask to project, maybe the entity that's attached to you will 
decide to terrify you while you're having an astral projection. Mm -hmm. uh, it would take opportunity of that. But uh, what normally happens, and keep in mind I've had thousands of astral project projections, mm -hmm. um, negative entities um, instinctively hide from astral projectors. So if you go out looking for them, it's difficult to find them because if they are around, they'll be hiding. Mm. They have an instinct in them to hide from us. Why would they do that? I think it is because if people see them, um, eventually we will put our minds to this as a problem. And if we do that, eventually we will come up with a solution. Okay, which yeah. is what which is what I have done. I mean, there are solutions. Like if you look at my book, The Practical Psychic Self-Defense Handbook, mm -hmm. uh, I give some brand new countermeasures in there that work, very effective, that people just don't know about because they're too new. Mm -hmm. I tried very hard to get in touch with the Vatican over this to try and exchange my new countermeasures for a little piece of information um, but I never got past the front door. The I good. even had letters written in Italian and given to their senior uh, demonologist by a television host that I knew that this person appeared on regularly and handed mm. them the letter written in Italian, Stonewall. Wow, they wow. Wouldn't, wouldn't talk to me. Now, the thing I've discovered is, if, if for example, if you come under massive demonic attack right now which is very very painful and distressing mm. uh, to say the least if you go and jump in your shower it stops instantly the moment you get in the shower why is it now, it may, you have to ask yourself why now when i first discovered this um many years ago I was um, like early 30s when I discovered this accidentally. And uh, the when I first discovered this, I thought it was because of the purity of water and, you know, relating to holy water or something like that. Mm. But it it's not just showers. I mean, showers are a good example. Um, it's like you put a garden hose on your back lawn and you turn that on so it's gushing water on the garden, on the lawn. If you're under attack, if you walk through that water, you'll stop the attack instantly. Oh, okay. You have crossed running water. But that same thing works with sewerage. If there is a sewer pipe there with liquid flowing through it there and you cross that, if an entity is attacking you, it will break the attack when you cross over it. It comes down to it. it's the... I think it is the um, the strength of the electrical earth okay, that yeah. you're exposing yourself to. That when you have running water on the ground, or if it's beneath the ground, and even in a water pipe, there seems to be a much stronger electrical earth in that area mm. than there is. If you can understand Australia, to put in um, a an electrical earth for a house, you have to drive a star picket four feet six inches into the ground mm. to get that's how far it's got to go in because of the sandy soil to get a reliable earth for a house my brother-in-law told me that he's a he's an electrician mm. and um but that's what it comes out now other states in australia in different areas where you have more clay in the soil is a completely different thing a completely different depth if you've got clay soil, you've only got to put it in a couple of feet. Mm. But it varies according to the, the, the structure of the soil and uh, the moisture content of the soil, of course. So, wow. Oh, wow. If you look into grounding, uh, you know, grounding products, earthing grounding products. Is that like the blankets that plug into the PowerPoint? Yep, yep. Yeah. That. They're very, very good idea uh, as a part of my countermeasures because if you have a grounding um, sheet normally, which you lay upon, um, that you plug into the mains and it's wired up only to the third earth pin, mm -hmm. um, 
no electricity involved in that. This gives you a very solid earth there. And if you're lying on there and bare skin is contacting that sheet that you're lying on, you mm -hmm. are electrically earth to the planet. Now there's massive health benefits to be had from being earth to the planet because mm -hmm. human beings evolved from over many millions of years in contact with the planet, walking on it in bare feet, um, uh, laying on it at night to sleep, we sleep on the ground, and you're constantly exposed to an electrical earth to the planet. Mm -hmm. And there is a flow, apparently there's a flow of free electrons from the planet into our bodies that our bodies have evolved to depend upon. So if you don't get these in, in, in the modern world, we wear insulated clothing and shoes, we drive around insulated cars, our floors are insulated. And the only time that we are exposed to earthing, uh, an earthing contact with the planet is when we're in a shower. It doesn't count if you're in a bath because a bathtub full of water is insulating you from the planet unless your right. tap is turned on. So it's almost like um, Mother Earth protects us from psychic attack. And it can be because if you have to understand that. I've explored this immensely by living it. And I'm looking for countermeasures which will keep me alive because these things were trying to kill me mm -hmm. over many years. And so I'm trying to um, survive here. And I found some things that work by experimenting. Now, it wasn't just working with me. Uh, it was a point I had... Uh, half a dozen families with children that had demonic possession problems mm. and massive psychic attacks happening at night. Children, you've only got to see a two or three year old little girl turn around and speak with the voice of an adult man, a deep voice. Mm. And you're convinced. Yeah. One yeah. phenomena, you are convinced for life. You will be scared shitless. Mm because there's nothing you know you can do about it. And you will be running to get my book and read it because it gives you some idea of what you can do with things like that. And mm. running water is one of the, one of the main count, countermeasures. Wow. It's a terrifying situation to be in. I can understand why people don't want to look into it and they don't want to admit it exists. Yeah, Most New Age right people right. think demons don't exist. They think they're just thought forms like they know what a thought form is. Mm, I understand. It's completely. like it's some kind of lesser being, but they're not. They're, uh, the world that we live in, in the non-physical sense, is crawling with trillions of, of, of spirit beings. Mm. We're surrounded by them. But it's like as we evolved, our senses evolved to keep ourselves focused here in the what we call the real world, because here is where our attention needs to be. Yeah. Here is where we have lions and tigers and things which are trying to eat us. We have enemies trying mm. to kill us and steal stuff. You know, you have to have be focused here completely. Mm. Um, otherwise, life is not going to be kind to you. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. And those, sorry, and those like demonic beings, do, are there some that are extremely, extremely dark that like, are able to like possess people and kind of try and um, get all demons. What, what demons possess? That is what they do. Yeah, is there demons a hierarchy? Possess. There are a great number. Of, there's like millions of different types of demons. Um, the lesser ones, the the basic legionnaires, they look like. Do you remember? Uh, you've seen Lord of the Rings. Yeah. You remember Gollum? Yeah. Remember Gollum. Yeah. They look exactly like Gollum, but they have little horns coming out of the forehead. Wow. But they look very much like him with the overlong legs and arms are a bit a bit longer than you expect for a yeah. torso that size. Back to the um the demons, the different types of demons. Um, the one that look like Gollum with the horns and the long legs. You said there's millions of different kinds. Are any of them like the Bible talks about, like fallen angels or? anything like that or is it just totally different well if you um understand how the uh, electrical earthing thing works um what happens is 
there was about, I think it's 8,000 lightning strikes around our planet every hour. Mm. Huge number. It's like a massive bombardment. Now, when lightning hits the earth, apart from a little bit of localized damage, the electricity spreads out over the surface of the earth instantaneously, like the speed of light. This goes over the surface of the land, over the oceans, everywhere. There is a field of energy. Um, obviously, it's not millions of volts at, by the time it gets uh, around the world, but it is there. It's scientifically known about. Now, um, this energy field flows up over the outside of your houses and buildings. It also flows along the, the floor, up the inside walls. It also flows up over your body. Now, this you will find if you explore it, not research it by books and that, you will find negative entities um, or demons are bound to the surface of the earth, literally bound. They, they live in this energy field. They are actually two-dimensional beings with no height to them. It's like a shadow on the ground that you can't see. Now, these beings are capable of projecting a 3D apparition above them, and you can see them because we're used to having eyes and visual sight. So we see them and we think it's a being like Casper the ghost that can fly through walls and do what it wants to do. But and negative entities can't. There's a lot of structures on their movements, and this is all spirits that are bound to the surface of the earth, including ex-human spirits that stay behind on lots of different types of entities. A lot of them are not, not demonic, mm. um, but they're spirit beings of one type or the other. And uh, they're, all the ones that bother humans are bound to the surface of the earth. The, so the earth element beings are 99% of the problem. Now, you can get problems with water, water spirits, fire spirits, and air spirits, but those, those problems are rare, very rare. You know, 99% of the problems with earth spirit. We are earth element beings. We walk upon the earth. Yeah. Spirits are attached to the earth. And this is why you have this continual interaction with negative entities trying to attach to humans uh, for various reasons. Mm. And out of that, demons are a more advanced, much more powerful type of spirit entity, even though, yeah, some of them are not particularly bright. The higher ones are incredibly smart. Um, I've had experiences before with negative entities, um, especially I had a housemate who was smoking a lot of weed, going through a tough time. And whenever he would leave to work at four in the morning, I'd have this dark entity just waltz into my room, but it wasn't, a, it didn't look human. It was massive black gray cloud. Its face would distort and change. And it would mm -hmm. seem to feel it before I would see it. And it would be terrifying. And it would try, it almost felt like it was sucking energy out of my chest through my left arm in a slow it reversed electric shock. There is a possibility that that is a negative entity, which you can hold in this hand here. There's also a possibility that that negative entity sighting was you, was your astral projected double, which you are seeing from your paralyzed physical body, which you didn't notice at the time you were asleep, but you had some sight through your closed eyeballs and you could see the your astral body, which appeared to you. Now, you interpret what you're seeing. Mm. I've had this um, experience given to me so many times. It's like weekly event from people. I'm being attacked by my evil doppelganger or something like that, you know. It's because we astral project a lot, and sometimes um, the astral body, there will be an interaction between the physical body and your astral body. And if your astral body is within 20 feet of you, 
literally you will feel a very strong, very powerful presence and it will be a scary presence. And the closer it is to you, the more terrifying that presence is. It feels scary. Uh, that's just how the, the energies of the astral projected double feel to the physical body if the physical body is still partly awake. Mm. It feels like a scary atmosphere. It literally feels like the devil himself is standing behind you with a raised axe about to chop your head off. Really? Imagine it's like it's like being it's like swimming in the ocean at night and knowing there is a great white shark below you. Mm. What, that what, sort of a feeling you get when uh, you're exposed to your own astral projected double. I have um after traveled before, just coincidentally in two different different ways, but it's very hard for me to replicate it all the time. But um, some of them have been really beautiful experiences where I've just floated above my body, yeah. seen myself and gone into outer space and then come back down. Or um, It can be. So it depends on the circumstances. Yeah. So you're talking about something where you are woken up four o'clock in the morning. Mm. And if it's if waking you up, it's happening around that same time. Mm. It's like there's other possibilities beyond. And you have to look at the one uh, one one explanation of that is what you've said, that this is a dark entity thing that's bothering you. But mm. I'm just offering some other possibilities that yeah. we can. But it's very easy to misinterpret what is happening. And a lot of people think that when they're exposed to something like this astral projection related phenomena, it mm. can terrify them. Yeah. And it, it's actually being caused by their own astral body. They don't know what's happening. He doesn't know what's happening. There is no guiding force involved. There mm. are no spirit guides standing around telling you what to do. There's no instruction manual. We, we don't know. So you have to apply like scientific method to this. Beautiful. And, and talk, talk it out and eventually we'll come to, we come to a conclusion. Beautiful. I mean, yeah. Just like... <laughs> Yeah, in regards to astral projection, I've got a question. So uh, to what extent can you actually astral project? So can you like astral project out of your physical body and kind of like travel to other destinations to like other destinations in the world? Or can you extend that to like other planets and other destinations around anywhere in the physical universe? Well, yes, you can travel in the physical universe. Uh, if you can do real-time projection, that's the, um, the closest form of projection to the physical reality where you are like a ghost in the real world. Now, some people can do that usually only for a short time. You know, you will spend the first maybe 30 seconds in real time before you shift into the astral planes. Uh, some people, however, like myself, when I was born, it took me probably 30 years before I worked out a way to get out of the real time zone. So I spent most of 30 years projecting as a ghost in the real world. Okay. Now, but there were spontaneous episodes where I would end up in the astral planes and things like that, but I didn't know how to get there mm, Yeah, or, or even where I was. You travel to but like yeah, you can you can definitely you can definitely travel in in the in real time, which is in the real world as t reality happens. Can, can can you give us a technique for for our viewers who could actually project for the first time how to do it, a method that they could do to use just to get them out of their body and experience the leaving of the body and the traveling in the real time. For sure. What you need to do, you need to be in a deeply relaxed state. So you need to be physically relaxed and mentally, mentally relaxed. And um, so if you are projecting from a bed, I recommend a chair is better. Mm -hmm. And like a, something like an armchair where you can put your feet up. And because there's something about the uh, being in an upright position with your torso that makes it a lot easier to ask to project. And you can do this in bed in your bedroom if you use several cushions behind you 
or something, but your bedroom is the worst place of all to do it because we are all psychologically programmed to begin falling asleep once we enter the bedroom. And when you get into your own bed, you are psychologically programmed to fall asleep within a few minutes. We all do that and you'll feel the difference. This is why you'll find most spontaneous astral projections happen when people are staying at somebody else's house, they get astral projection related phenomena. If you're staying somewhere that is not your home uh, or if you get up, if you're sleeping on the couch in a different room, something like that is involved because you don't sleep quite as deeply as you do in your own bed that you normally sleep in. And so that's a bad place to astral project from because it's very difficult to remain awake enough to do it. You'll just fall asleep. Okay. Um, so do that, put yourself in a deeply relaxed state and then imagine and feel, try and get your muscles to feel without physically moving. Um, what I tell people to do is imagine they are climbing a rope that's hanging down from the ceiling, a nice strong rope, and they can reach up and climb up that rope out of their body. Now, if you do this with your arms, pretending you're climbing and <clears throat> memorize what it feels like for these muscles to move and then try and imagine that and feel that without physically moving. You don't want your physical body to respond. That's no. using your body awareness, tactile imaging. That's the energy work system I teach. And it's also the same technique for um, <clears throat> leaving your body. Now, if you keep climbing that rope in a deeply relaxed state, you will trigger an astral projection. Mm -hmm. And the secret to remembering it is, and I bully all my students about this, and I get letters every day from students saying, I'm glad I listened to you, because I tell people, focus on a 10-second out-of-body experience. No more. If you stay out any longer, your physical body will fall deeper and deeper asleep to the point where it won't wake up and your astral body won't be pulled back in maybe for several hours. Oh, wow. So you can get which stuck time you are going to completely lose the memory of the astral projection, ah. even though it happens and even though it happens regularly. Mm. The idea is because when you're out of body and you're, you know, flying around, whatever, typically it's like you've been smoking dope. It's like, wow, everything's so green, man. You know, you're just <laughs> looking and you're, you're, you're mainly observing. That's what you're doing. You're looking and it's all new and fascinating and, and you're just observing. You're, nothing really happening. There's no energy in this happening. So when you're pulled back in, it's like you're pulled back in and boop, you're on, you've just woken up. There's nothing to download. There's, it, there's not enough power in this memory to make an impression on your physical body's memory. So you get pulled back in, it's gone. The idea is 10 seconds out of body and just guess it. I mean, have a quick look around, you're out of body, look at your hands and watch them melt. Your hands will melt in about three seconds flat and you'll have little stumps for wrists. Nobody knows why this happens. It's a regular phenomena. Wow. Look at your hands, watch them melt. Yeah. And then dive back into your physical body with a couple of key words from the experience. And you want to dive back in passionately, savagely shouting your success to get mm. some energy going mm. into it. It's like imagine you're bungee jumping or jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. Imagine what you'd have to do to, to strengthen yourself to jump off that edge. You know, it, you know, we human beings, men, we psych ourselves up like this. If we're going into battle, we mm. make ourselves really angry and psych ourselves up so we can run down and go, yeah, you know, mm. it's you need to do the same thing in reverse to get back in your physical body. So you've got a lot of power in this memory mm. and you're shouting your key words, hands melted, dive back in your physical body mm. and you will wake up. With that in your, with the memory in your head, but you cannot trust it. 
that memory can disappear in a heartbeat. And you've had it there for maybe a minute while you're rummaging for a, a, a piece of paper and a pen to write it down on. And while you're doing that, the memory just drifts away like a cloud. And you say, oh, no, it's gone. Where is it? And it might come back. And you say, oh, I've got it back again. And then it drifts away. And you will never get it back. But the interesting thing after an experience like that, it happens with dreams as well, is you remember the experience. You remember waking up and you had this really cool memory. You don't know what it was. And then you remember it went away and you fought to bring it back. Oh, no, what was it? And it came back. You remember that happening. And then you remember it, it drifting away again and you completely lost it. You never got it back. But you remember what happened. You remember that you had a good memory and that it came and went a couple of times before disappearing. There's something really weird going on with the memory process. Mm. If you have this experience yourself, and everybody's had this, where you wake up and you've had a dream, oh, that was a really cool dream, and say, your partner might say, what was that about? So, oh, it's gone. Mm. They disappear really easily. There's some weird stuff happening. Yeah. We don't know what it is, but I have found practical ways around that. So mm. with astral projection, keeping it short, making a deliberate, passionate re-entry. Mm. And then as soon as you wake up, verbalize your key words. Say, hands melted, hands melted, while you grab a pen and paper, which should be on your bed, and yeah. hands melted. And then write down the key words first. There might be something else there. Mm. You might have seen something else. And then while you've got the pen in your hand, write down a few more details, anything, mm. whatever you can get. I'll tell you what happens here about once, twice a year, maybe, um, depending on what I'm doing here, I wake up in the morning and I always do the same thing. I go to the coffee machine and put on a coffee. And there was a piece of paper on top of the coffee machine. And I don't know what that is, but I'm knowing my ways because I know myself. I think it could be a note from me, mm. and it is. I can't make out the writing. It's very bad handwriting on there. There's a few words on there, and I'm going like this, trying to decipher it because I was really groggy when I wrote it. And mm. then I make out one word, and boom, two hours of memories come back into my head. Book length. A book length memory comes back, clear as day, because I'd left myself a note. Amazing. It's important. So you've got this really weird stuff, again, happening with memories. And this is why it's difficult to ask to project. Even if you are succeeding every time you try, you will lose the memories if you stay out too long. The idea is keep it 10 seconds for the first few astral projections until you get a little bit of experience with the process of exiting and re-entering your body and then extend it, go to 30 seconds, and then go to maybe, then try one minute. Because keep in mind that you're limited on when you astral project out of your physical body, that's going to make your physical body feel very tired because at least 50% of your consciousness energy is leaving with the astral body. So your astral body is going to feel paralyzed and really tired, and you're just very easy to just fall asleep. Now, when you fall asleep, your physical body is going to nosedive in deeper and deeper levels of sleep very quickly. Mm. Now, once you get beyond light sleep, let's face it, I mean, sometimes it's very difficult to wake a person up. Yeah. You know, little things. Now, the astral body, when it comes back in, it causes a little bit of a tingling which will normally you know, cause alertness and help us wake up. But mm. if you're deeply asleep, that won't happen. Your astral body will try to get back in and it won't be able to. The experience is like you will jump onto your physical body and you are like pounding on it. Let me in. And you think, oh, my God, my physical body's died because it feels cold and damp like mm. a corpse. 
because that's how the physical body feels to the astral body. The yeah. physical body feels cold and damp, like it's dead. Now, that will remain that way until the physical body wakes up and then pulls you back in again. So is and, there, there's no other way to get back in your body besides jumping in it? Is there any shortcuts or things you can do to bring yourself in, or do you have to wait for that time lapse of the body to pull All you? All you have to do is, if you can't see the body in front of you, just think about your body. And, and the room it was in when you left it, like your bedroom. Just imagine you were there and you'll be there instantly. Oh, wow. That's, That's the only shortcut there is. Okay. If, but if you are in the room, you might be able to see your body in front of you and then you would dive back in it again. Mm. The other way is, I mean, just, so, you know, uh, having the intention that you're going to go back in right now you know, and try and get some energy behind that um, so that you will remember it. And then remember to verbalize it a couple of words and repeat them over and over again until you've written something down. Now, because I, two seconds later, that memory can disappear. Oh, can I ask you about the real time zone? Because in your book, you said as an experiment, you get a, a random playing card, make sure you don't see it. Yeah. You stick it on your window facing outwards and you're going to try and actual project and see the card. Yeah, that's a good test. I have a, a friend of mine who's a, an engineer in uh, uh, Statesville in, in the States, in North Carolina, mm. and uh, he's a very, uh, very good astral projector and remote viewer, mm. and he gets, he calculated a 78% success rating doing that. Now, that means there's a, like a 20% failure rate at doing that, but it is doable. Yeah. When you remote view, are you actual projecting or are you only seeing? Like what, uh, how do you? They are all connected. I mean, remote viewing is what uh, clairvoyant, it used to be called clairvoyance. Mm. They, they changed the name and called it remote viewing to make it sound more scientific. And this was done by scientists when they were studying it yet for military purposes. Mm. Um, so, but clairvoyance is remote viewing and remote viewing is excellent. Uh, I recommend anybody interested in that learns a protocol mm. for remote viewing because it gives you a, a very accurate protocol for, um, for getting psychic information and interpreting it. And I mean, typically uh, remote viewing is done. You have a person that sets up a target and you set up you want to look at and you put some pictures maybe and some inf text information in an envelope and you seal that envelope and you put two random four digit numbers on it on that envelope and then you record that and then you put you file that envelope and you send maybe by email you send that um, two four digit numbers to the remote viewer that's going to view it and he gets those two, four numbers. And when he opens the email, the instant you look at those, there is a gestalt occurs. This is a psychic phenomena, which is well known. Mm. A, a gestalt is like there's a little moment of knowing, a split second of knowing. Yeah, It's like when you, um, if you're walking down the street and there's people walking by and occasionally you look up and, lock eyes with somebody for a split second and there's like a when you first meet someone there's a little bit of information about what that person is like passes into you you get like a gut feeling about a person mm. um and this is what the remote viewer gets from the two four digit numbers he looks at that a gestalt occurs an idea a split second of information about that downloads into him mm. and then he goes through the protocol which is usually a series of like a hundred questions that he asks himself about that what did this feel like what did it taste like how big is it and you're using your imagination and that to and all your uh, senses see what this fit feels like mm. and you can be amazingly accurate with this if so you, you can remote view inside an envelope inside a cabinet yeah. Amazing. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Because you, know, you can have that two four-digit numbers can pass through several people 
before it's actually presented to the remote viewer. And typically the remote viewer would be in a relaxed state and he will have the information there on a piece of paper and he will open his eyes, turn the page over. So mm. you get you can improve the gestalt effect where that information behind that two, four digit number downloads. Could, could someone like oh, yourself remote, <coughs> remote view maybe inside the White House or Area 51 or things of that nature? Anywhere on the planet, anywhere in the, anywhere in the universe. But would you have to have already experienced it or you can no, just think about it? this is different to astral projection. This is remote viewing. You will get, uh, you may not know where you, you may not know where this remote viewing, let's say it is the White House, you, you may pick that up as you go through the protocols wow. for interpreting the remote viewing. Remote viewing is not like psychic ability. It's, it involves a little bit of psychic ability. And the more of that you have, the mm. more accurate you're going to be. Okay. But there's a very strict protocol for interpreting that, which you can uh, extract from that good information. Is that in your astral dynamics book? Information I do it? have a, a vision interpretation protocol there. Okay. But no, I, I don't give remote viewing methods there. Um, yeah. I did in the, the first edition. The first edition was like 600 pages. It was a lot larger. Mm. Um, and I, But I removed quite a lot of that book when I did why, the second edition. Why was that? Why did you remove the remote viewing stuff? Purely space. It's, the book is mm. theme is about astral projection. True, yeah. You know, Going too far into other topics is a no-no. Mm. And I was conserving space because I needed to make space mm. to put a lot of new content in the book when I did the second edition. In do, you have any, do you have any remote viewing information or the protocol on your website? No. Uh, there are plenty of people around the, that do this. Okay. I, recommend, I recommend Googling major... Uh, major, as in the military major, Ed Dames. Major Ed Dames. E -D -D -A -M -E -S. Major Ed Dames. And you will come up with all kinds of remote viewing courses and things like that, which he, to, which he does quite well. Yeah. Is it possible for you to like re remote view and like, let's say you wanted to access, access some like information in the Vatican or something, or would they have like some sort of... Um, barrier or people who are there to protect you from actually going in there and remote viewing is there is that is that possible i think there are in some places in the world do have protection against um astral projectors spirits and things like that mm. but uh not you can't block remote viewing because to remote view you're not actually going there you are extracting information directly from the akashic records Oh, That's what really happens with remote viewing. Wow. So the actual information you're getting is not from the physical. You're actually getting the, the metaphysical copy in the Akashic Records you're downloading. If you look at the it. Akashic Records, it's like there is a continual flow of information uh, from the physical universe into it. So wow. uh, if you remote, this is what clairvoyance does. Clairvoyance, you're extracting information from the... Akashic records, remote viewing is the same. They don't call it this, um, but this is what I think happens. Wow. And this is how remote viewing works. Can I just say with the real time zone, which is the closest dimension around the earth that we go to when we have to travel, you were saying mm -hmm. that if you try to, that card I was saying on the window, if you try to guess what card it is, you'll actually interfere with the process yeah. of the card itself. So do our thought forms manipulate this real time zone? Uh, you can do, particularly when you're in it, because your imagination is very powerful and if your, your guesswork and your imagination, uh, like if you're guessing what this card is before you get there, it's very hard not to guess mm. an outcome. And if you're guessing that, I bet it's a queen of hearts, you'll, you might see the queen of hearts. Mm. Spades. You know, because you're trying to preempt it, or as soon as you start to see the colors as you go out there, you know, your guesswork leaps in. Ah, oh, it's a queen of hearts, but it's not. Yeah. You, know, that... you need to 
you need to keep your mind very clear and relaxed and just ex- see what's happening. Um, so can you see any correlations with the real time zone and our thoughts manipulating reality? Can that same thing happen? Let's say if people are, are very, very fearful, they're going to meet a demon or whatever. Could they project a demon into their real time yeah. zone, be scared yeah, of it and yeah. then jump back into their body? You can, you can imagine one. You can cause the phenomena that's going to scare you. You can mm. produce that yourself. Yeah. Um, you can also attract it if you are very fearful. Mm. Once you start becoming afraid, it, it can, it can over, overtake you and you're projecting mm. a lot of fear. That can attract negative entities. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unlikely that it would attract a demon unless the demon is already on your case. Fair enough. If you already have it. You know, it, but it will attract like local garden variety entities that will pretend to be demons. Oh, true, true. That is very interesting. interesting. Yeah. Um, so if you can conquer your fear, you you conquer the problem because mm. you are the problem. As I said earlier, when you know you are the problem, when you are, if you're having a, an experience like four o'clock in the morning, kind of regularly. You know, you, you've got something happening in there, and it's most likely, in my experience, your own astral body mm. causing the issue. And you're guessing what is happening. You're trying to interpret what's happening, and you don't have enough understanding or experience to interpret them. So you jump to conclusions oh, this looks like a real evil thing. And you're projecting thoughts that this is a bad entity up there. So it starts to look and feel scary. Yeah. And you're contributing to this. True. Without that, I mean, your own real time projected double is creates enough energy which feels bad Mm. it feels negative and scary that's what it feels like but it isn't it's just you is that because it's 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 an unusual unknown experience that we interpret it straight away as as fearful when in reality it may not be scary with the astral body i've done a lot of experimenting with this over the years and the astral body itself, there is an interaction with your own physical body and astral body that when you are close, particularly when you are both conscious, you get a lot of feedback. This disappears about 20 feet of distance. But when you get close, like if you're in the same bedroom, mm. you're going to get quite an intense feeling from your own, caused by your own astral body. Like an interference pattern or something with a... No, it feels like it's... It feels like something is pulling at you and it feels like something really evil is standing behind you with a raised axe. Mm. It's something really scary it's right behind you. It's always behind you, regardless so of the direction it's in. That's what it feels like. Is that because the um, like the, the third eye gets information from the back of the head or, or is it just a... I don't, I don't know. Mm. I really, I really don't know. I mean, you could be lying in this position. Your astral body is is upright to your right hand side, but you're still going to feel it pulling on you from behind. Can- Typically, dream, keep in mind your dream mind can be involved with this as well. Mm. There's you on the physical bed, partly awake. Your astral body is out here, fully awake. Your dream mind can be awake as well at the same time and contributing to the eventual memory. So the dream mind is dreaming that it's walking through the house, going to get a cookie or some whatever. Mm. And then suddenly something scary is behind the dream mind, pulling it backwards. And it's like, Mm. it's like you, you imagine you're suddenly walking through concrete and it's hard to walk and move away and something's pulling you backwards, something evil. And this is, you've got a tug of war going between your dream mind, your physical mind and your astral body mind. Mm -hmm. And they're all pulling against each other. And of course, usually the physical body wins and everything comes Mm -hmm. back into it and you wake up. (laughs) Oh, that was scary. Yeah. All these mixed memories. And then depending upon if you have religious beliefs and things you've seen on television, you put two and two together and come up with 47. Yeah, you get, yeah, exactly. Can I just say one last question? I had someone reach out to me um, over TikTok and he actually projects purely by accident, but when he leaves his body, he's in his room and he's floating, he can't actually move 
his astral body at all. He's like he's stuck in suspended in in space. And um, what would cause that? Know, and how would you? I know what that is. What, what what do you think that is? What what you've got there is you have an early spontaneous astral projection from a person who doesn't yet have the ability to animate his astral body. Now, it takes a fair bit of, you could say, um, if you have an older soul, you'll mm. find often the astral body is, is um, strong enough to um, maintain a weight consciousness out of the body. Yep. But if, you, if it's younger, often you can have the astral, project, astral projection occur, but the phys, what happens is the astral body is paralyzed. And it will often drift to the floor and you'll find yourself like a, you know, like a balloon bouncing slowly on the floor, yeah. rolling around like a balloon. Yeah. It's, you don't have any power. and It's just because you're new to this. Mm. If a person keeps trying to astral project, it may take a couple of years, mm. but eventually they will start getting some movement in the astral body and then they can start moving it around and doing things. But it can take time. And anybody can do this, mm. but for some people they might need to put in a few years of regular altered state meditation on a daily mm. basis. And that itself with maybe a bit, a little bit of energy work, um, you know, developing their chakras and that, that, that will cause their, their astral body to develop to the point where it can maintain uh, con awake consciousness. Okay, beautiful. So it's like a baby almost. Well, we've yeah, done- It is very much like that. Yeah. We, we've just done three rounds of 40 minutes, which is- Absolutely mind blowing. A lot to integrate. A lot to think about. A lot more. Than I've I actually been known to speak for seven days without yeah. repeating myself. Well, I, I would love you to can't do, help it. <laughs> I would really love to do this again and talk, focus more on energy work and life after death and all that kind of stuff. But um, sure. I did. I did. By the way, I did coast to coast AM radio show last week. Two hour show. Wow. Wow. Yeah. They has at least forty million listeners. Mm. It's, it's the biggest long format radio talk show in the world. I've been on there a few times. I just. That's incredible. I just wanted to really thank you for spending this time with us and sharing and going yeah. deep with all these stories. They're really. Oh, it's really my pleasure. It's, it's like, um, I really enjoy doing radio and talking to people and stuff, which I do about my work. And, yeah. Um, so it's like one of my most fun things to do. Yeah, which is why I tend to, but given my age as well, I tend to go off into everything is a story. Everything yeah. is an anecdote. It becomes one, you know. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's beautiful. Very well articulated as well. And it's kind of sucks you in. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that epic conversation with Robert Bruce himself. How amazing it is to hear about this man's experiences. And he gives us knowledge that we can not only learn from but we can actually apply and experience for ourselves and he's one of the very few that does this for free there is so much content on this man's website astraldynamics.com i highly recommend heading to astraldynamics.com and jumping on some of the free workshops and classes this man's giving away in video format and in blog form on how to raise your kundalini how to astral project psychic self-defense and so much more so jump on their website and stick around, like, share, subscribe. There will be a part two coming very soon. We talked to Robert about energy work, chakras and life after death and diving deeper into healing and that sort of stuff. So we'll see you then. Take care. Love you all. Peace out.